Okay, our next speaker is Jay Crutchfield. He's our quartermaster. His topic is life in the, in the military, not only during World War II, but all wars. Please be seated, excuse me. And how their families became involved in their support. I've been asked to talk a bit about the life of these military men here and to kind of contrast that over the years to what the current military guy is experiencing. One of the first things I noticed was that this group of men here came from largely urban, or excuse me, rural environments. A lot of them were farm kids, grew up on farms. Most of them were city kids, but in very small farming, ranching communities. That, that kind of built in a, a self-reliance and a self-confidence because they hunted and fished to put food on the, the table for their family. They raised their own livestock, processed it to feed their families. And they had other kind of farm chores like picking cotton and corn and baling hay, hauling hay. So they, they were a tough lot, very self-reliant. Over the years, the source of military people has moved, migrated as the cities have become larger. More and more of our young soldiers and sailors are coming from, from urban environments where they don't have these same kind of experiences. Now, you can train that, but it's kind of expensive to do. But it has been done. We have a very professional military today, very accomplished, very accommodating. Uh, a lot of these guys joined up after World War II. That was a very pivotal, traumatic event in our history of our nation. Uh, Many volunteered. Some, like Mr. Went, got his little letter. He was a student at the time. He got the letter. Uh, you can read his book, but in his book he says he hitchhiked to Schulenburg, and then he walked the rest of the way home, arriving on his front porch about 3 a.m. Didn't want to wake the family, so he slept on a, on a couch on the front porch. And his dad came out about 5 o'clock in the morning and found him there sleeping. When he was discharged from the military, he was discharged in San Antonio, I believe, hitchhiked to, I'm not sure where he hitchhiked there, but he ended up walking the last seven miles. Let me fix this. Please. That was your heart? <laughs> that was your This thing's not, it doesn't tune out pacemakers, so I'm sorry. <laughs> So he walked again, he walked the last seven miles home, got there at three o'clock in the morning, went to sleep on the porch, his dad got up at five o'clock, found him on the porch. That was kind of the way the... Would you turn yours off, please? I'm not sure what the problem is, sorry. Uh, but that's kind of the way most of these World War II veterans were very self-reliant. If something needed to be done, they just did it. And they had the skills to do it. A lot of them, when they got the draft notice, when they volunteered, ended up in an induction center where they were assigned a branch of the military to go to, and then they were shipped off to their basic training site. Today's soldiers and sailors and airmen can choose the branch of the service they want to go into, choose the specific skill they want, and that's evolved over time, and especially with the removal of the draft in the, in the mid-60s, where everybody today is a volunteer. It wasn't that case in, in World War II, it wasn't that case in Korea, it wasn't that case in the early phases of, of Vietnam. I got a draft notice. I was told to show up at the Grange. Fortunately, I'd already signed up for the Navy, so that was took care of that. And many of us were that same way. We had more choice in our generation than these gentlemen did. And so off they went to basic training. Uh, induction centers were no thrill ride. It was very chaotic. <coughs> What's going to happen to me? Where am I going? And you didn't know that until you got to the induction center. So off to basic training. Basic training contrasting then as opposed to the Korea, Vietnam, and now has changed, but not all that dramatically. In their case, they went into large multi-story barracks, open bay, lots of bunk beds, no privacy, open bay showers, uh, dining in huge mess halls, hot, hard training, with in many cases inexperienced drill instructors because the Army in particular, as well as other branches, had really phased down 
And so they had to get ready to go very fast. So they had a lot of inexperienced officers and drill instructors preparing them. And if you contrast that over the years, that has improved a lot. Where today's recruits uh, going to the military, their barracks are not a whole lot different than that. They're still largely open bay bunk beds, but they're all air conditioned, more modern facilities there. Plus, when they went through the basic training, there were no phone calls home. They, they couldn't go down to a phone bank and call home. Whereas today's recruits can do that. They have a little bit more time, but still it's pretty restricted once you're in basic training. Um, the food is better today than it was then. The drill instructors are a bit more mature today than, than back then, or at least more experienced. Uh, when they went through training, they were barracked with members of their same race. There was no mixed race uh, barracks as there are today. Females are still separated today, but in their days, females were trained at a totally different base. And so females today are birth separately, but they train as a unit. They train with the men in their, their assigned unit. Once they finish their basic training and they get their specific skill assignment, they go off to additional skill training. That's still the case today. But in their case, they went to basic training on buses or trains. Today, if you leave one base, training base going to another, you'll go via airplane, unless it's really, really close. And I don't know how it was when you went through your basic training, when you got to LaGrange for your induction, if they put you up in a fancy hotel while you, you waited to, to, to go. But, but, but that happens today. If you go to Houston for your induction, and uh, if you need to stay overnight there, they'll put you up in a local very nice hotel. And certainly the night before you ship, you stay in a very nice hotel. Bus comes to the airport, picks you up, takes you to the airport, and off you fly to your, to your recruit training center, your boot camp. How many of you flew to your, to your boot camp training location? No, it didn't happen. They always said, just get on the bus. So the basic training that, that they received, unless you were going into something like airplane mechanic or something like that, the, the amount of extra training you got after boot camp was pretty restricted. That's changed over years as our military has become more and more technologically advanced. Certainly in Korea with the introduction of jet engines, jet airplanes flying off carriers with catapults. Uh, helicopters came into use in, in Vietnam time frame, excuse me, Korea. Uh, so the training change became much more complex, a bit more technological. And um, so that's, that's going on in today's military today. You can see all the satellite surveillance we have, all the all the flying the drones from Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, those pilots are controlling airplanes halfway around the world. And that's all done by multiple satellite bounces to get that data to and from the drone and the controller. So the, the training is much more extensive today, much more technological. It's much less urgent today because they had a greater sense of urgency because we had just been attacked. Training today is a bit more relaxed, and it's much more technically challenging. If you're, a, if you're an infantryman, it's still the same. And the Army still has a, the, the motto, I don't know if it's a, an official motto, but the Marines also have it, is that it doesn't matter if you're a truck driver or you're a computer technician or you're, you're whatever, you're just one step away from being an infantryman. If your base gets overrun or you get attacked, you need to know how to defend yourself and your fellow soldier or sailor. So once you finish their training and they travel to their, to their ultimate unit, they got additional training there, and then most of them, in this case, World War II, shipped out for an overseas location. And one of the gentlemen mentioned it earlier, you went via troop transport, troop ship. Those were like luxury, luxury cruise liners you, you go on your cruises today, right? <laughs> No, it was pretty bad. I, I spent 20 years in the Navy and I made one deployment on one of these World War II troop ships to England and back. It had been upgraded dramatically from World War II, but you've seen the stories about life on a troop ship where hundreds of soldiers and, and Marines below decks, tight, tight bunk beds berthing in little hammock type things. 
hot, weren't air conditioned like they are now. You had portholes that you could open and hope to get some breeze through there. Perhaps there was a fan to move some air around the, the birthing area, but it was, it was hot, it was frustrating. And especially if you were transiting the Atlantic, and occasionally during the Pacific where there was a torpedo drill, shipping to general quarters, all these portholes got closed, all the doors got closed. They got really hot. And the panic, <coughs> just the trauma of even a torpedo attack drill is very traumatic. An actual drill where the ship starts maneuvering, you're, you're down in the hold of this ship, what, what's going to happen if we get hit? Very traumatic. So then you get into combat. Well, combat's combat, whether it's World War II, Korea, Vietnam, in between Iraq, Afghanistan. It's not pretty, it's not nice, especially if it's hand-to-hand, -hand, up close and personal. Uh, it's very traumatic. The sights, the sounds, the smells of combat are unlike anything anybody's ever experienced. Now, those individuals who were raised on farms who were used to processing their own animals for food, were not unaccustomed to the sights and sounds and smells of death. <coughs> but nonetheless, when it's happening to a friend of yours, it's very traumatic, then as today. And a lot of these gentlemen, you, you heard, uh, I forget who mentioned it, the, the bombs going off, the rockets, the, the cannon attacks, and, and all the explosions nearby. Uh, even if you're on one of the battleships, just the sound of the 16-inch guns and the shock waves that they created are terribly damaging. And today we call that PTSD or traumatic brain injury. And we have specific protocols for people who are injured by these improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, my daughter worked at Bethesda Naval Hospital for a number of years treating uh, Army and Marine coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who had been victims of these, you know, these uh, IED attacks. And some of that's pretty sad. In World War II, we didn't have that designation. The, the term that was used was coined in World War I called shell shock. Well, that's just shell shock. Today, we call that PTSD or traumatic brain injury because we now know a whole lot more about the causes of injury to the brain and the impact of, of this constant fight or flight has on your adrenal glands and how that impacts PTSD. I guess the one thing that's changed most dramatically over the years from World War II through Korea, Vietnam to Iraq, Afghanistan is field medicine. Now, in World War II, your medics were pretty well trained and pretty well equipped. And the individual soldiers in the field, the Marines, had their own medical packs and could provide some of their initial basic care. That's gotten better and better and better over the years, where you've seen these programs on History Channel and others about these medevac helicopters, where you have specific assigned units that that's all they do and they have very, very highly trained individuals on those helicopters, medics as well as the crewmen, who can provide life-saving treatments right there. And if they can get you to a field hospital within that first golden hour, then your chance of survival are much, much better. And it's not unusual today for somebody to be injured in Iraq or Afghanistan today and be in Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. That's not at all unusual, and I'll contrast that with these men here and their experiences on the battlefield. If you were injured on the battlefield, you may stay in that theater, that area, for days before they could get you to a, a, a hospital ship offshore, where you would be treated and then put on another ship to take you to a port someplace nearby where you could get on another ship to come home. You know, the air transport of people from Korea, World War II, and even early days Vietnam was not like it is today. They just didn't have that. That's why you see so many large U.S. military grave sites in Europe and Asia. If you've been to some of these, there's, there's a large one in Hawaii in the Punch Bowl, which is a, 
inactive volcano. There's a massive one in the Philippines, in the Asia side, Pacific side. There are numerous uh, cemeteries in, uh, in Europe, World War II soldiers, still, still there. They just did not have the transport mechanism to get them home in, in sufficient time. And so that to me is, is field medicine and our ability to get injured people out of the fields quickly is, is a dramatic change. Um, communications, these gentlemen didn't have many opportunities to, to talk, send letters back to their family. And, and letters was about the only way they could consistently talk to their families, communicate with their families. And that just took forever. And especially if they were in training and moving around from location to location, and especially once you were engaged in some combat operation where you're island hopping, and this unit was going to be assigned over here to do this, now you've been pulled back from there, now you're assigned over here. The male people who were trying to keep up with you, it was terrible. And that didn't change a whole lot through my experience in Vietnam. It would take six weeks for me to write a letter and get it back to my wife living in San Diego, California, for her to respond to my letter and get it back to me was anywhere from four, four to six weeks. It was worse for these guys. It's much better today. That started changing a little bit in Vietnam. Some of the guys on some of the military bases in Vietnam had access to what we call, let me see, I have to remember it, MARS. I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's a high frequency radio transmitter that you would contact a ham operator in the US <coughs> who could then dial in the phone number for your family or spouse. And via the, 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 the radio communications, depending on the atmosphere, the, the atmosphere had to be right to get the right bounce pattern for your high frequency signal. And then you still had to treat it like a two-way radio over so that the guy on the other end knew to switch his receiver to transmit mode and vice versa. And so it was, it was painfully frustrating to make a phone call. Now in the military, I, I was on an aircraft carrier. We got to go in the Philippines every six weeks or so. And there was a bank of phones there in one of the exchange facilities where we could wait in line until our turn came. We went in this little booth and we could maybe make a phone call back home. But the phone lines were, were all underwater at the time, and so the, the, the quality of that conversation was, was not really good. And you only had a limited amount of time you could talk. Very frustrating. And it was even worse for these gentlemen. Much, much better now. My son did a tour in Iraq, and he could call from his little trailer that he lived in, and, and we could chat fairly frequently. <coughs> now, it had to be certain times a day when the circuits were not heavily used, but it happens. It happened very frequently. It's much more easy today for the soldiers and, so and Marines in Iraq, Afghanistan to communicate with family. Email is now available to them as well as satellite communications. So communications has changed dramatically. But if you're a family back home, not much has changed. And if you're a soldier away from home, not much has changed. You still get very lonely. You still miss your family. You still miss things. You miss graduations and funerals and births. Many, many, many soldier has missed the birth of their child because they were deployed. And if your family at home, it's, it's not easy. So those who went through World War II, families at home, in addition to missing their, their soldier, <laughs> marine, or sailor, also had to do, endure some of the other not so nice aspects of war, and that is there was rationing in World War II. <laughs> Gasoline was rationed, eggs, milk, shoes, a lot of things were rationed, and you got your ration card, and they, the government kept track of how much you had left on your ration card and how much you could buy. Fortunately, we don't have those problems today. The gentlemen who were in the military didn't experience the, the impact of rationing because you were rationing to support them. And it's that same way today. There's this large pyramid that's required to support the military. From the producers down at the low level, the farmers, the ranchers, the, the factories who send their, their products to the left level for refinement, and then on up to where it gets into the military system. It's transported within the military system to the guys out on the pointy end of the stick 
who were using it out on the ships, out on the deployed units, who used the goods and services that were produced by, down at the lowest level, and then it works its way up. It's still required today. And, and that's basically the way any successful campaign works. But there's still loneliness. There's still the lack of communications. And so that is the contrast that I provided. I hope you have a better understanding of life in the military uh, from the World War II days to, to life in the military today. So I have been asked by Mr. Jackson, oh, one of the things I also wanted to note is that at the end of World War II, you heard many of them say, when it was over, I came home and I got on with my life. That's just what they did. That was the nature of that generation. Just, this is what we do. Four gentlemen of this group are charter members of this post. They started this post 72 years ago. And they helped put up this building. Billy Jackson, Mr. Rudolph, Dr. Lamp, and Mr. Wendt. The VFW organization calls them comrades. I don't necessarily like that term for communist connotations, but these are our comrades. These are our comrades in arms, our fellow veterans. And you know, I have tremendous respect for what they endured, the conditions under which they endured them, and the fact that they just, when it was all over, they came home and just got on with their life. I was raised in Belleville, and um, Stephen Jackson has written a series of articles in the Belleville Times called The Boys of Class of 38, or Boys of 1938. I don't know how many of you have read that series. It's an excellent series. But the majority of those men that he talks about in that football team in 1938, Bill Jackson's one of them, went on into the military and came home and got on with their lives. So I have tremendous respect for them. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present this to you. Now, Mr. Jackson has asked me...